Good, good evening, good morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello, our dear telemessing clients and contacts in particular in the Asian region. We have scheduled that for the morning so that you can participate um, on this topic, new standard contractual clauses. I know from various discussions already that uh, this is not already, let's say, it, um, it's not already there, for example, in Japan. Uh, we discussed this with our um, Japanese clients. And um, whereas we are at the moment very nervous and uh, very excited about what's going on, um, I realize that outside of Europe, uh, this is not the case yet, but I can promise, and you will be aware after our uh, kickoff seminar today, that um, you realize that this is of high importance for actually every company. Uh, why? Because all companies um, uh, these days have international data transfers, and these international data transfers um, are including transfers from the EU uh, outside of the EU. And you all know um, that this in the past had been an issue, that this needs to have a kind of yeah, justification, um, and a, a transfer justification, and we come uh, to the mechanisms um, at the later stage, but um, from a very practical point, uh, with these new standard contractual clauses and with the obligation that all clauses have to be replaced with the new standard contractual clauses, every in each company needs to do um, a data mapping, uh, know your transfers, and replace current agreements. So simply already, let's say from the physical, organizational work, looking for the contracts, um, finding the right parties to the agreement, replacing old standard contractual clauses with new standard contractual clauses, plus maybe even negotiating that in the light of SRAMS 2, because SRAMS 2 is embedded in the standard contractual clause. This is a massive project. This is nothing what you can just do um, let's say, in between your day-to-day -day work, this is a huge thing. And the deadlines, and we come to the deadlines in a second, are comparatively tight. So um, it's good that you are here and that we have this one hour, I would say, kickoff session with respect to standard contractual clauses so that you are aware about what's going on at a comparatively early stage. Um, when you have questions, please, uh, um, ask these questions, put them in the chat. At the end of the session, uh, I hopefully have uh, like um, 10 minutes time um, to discuss uh, uh, things. I'm sure you have tons of questions. Uh, and um, as an additional service, um, everything we do not answer um, in that yeah, workshop seminar, uh, I will answer uh, afterwards um, uh, one by one. So. No one should leave that session with a feeling all my questions are unanswered and I still have that burden on my shoulders. But let's go. Um, new standard contractual clauses. Uh, what's, what's going on here? And uh, practically spoken, uh, what are the deadlines? Um, because everyone only starts to move things uh, when uh, you know that you have to. And as I said uh, earlier, the deadlines in my eyes are comparatively strict. What does it mean? The new standard contractual clauses had been published on the uh, 7th of June, so uh, basically one month ago. Uh, this, uh, the respective act, says that within a deadline of three months, and this is until 27th of September, companies can still use the old uh, current standard contractual clauses in place. However, that means from 27th September uh, 2021 onwards, all new agreements uh, which needs to have um, uh, containing a data transfer need to be um, done with the new SSCs. So that means from today, if you're not yet started until 27th of September, at least what you need as a controller, uh, so the one who's responsible for the transfer of the data, uh, most likely situated um, in Europe, 
you need to have a template in place. So you need to know uh, what kind of um, uh, agreements uh, you will like, how your standard contractual clauses look like, how there are uh, need to be uh, adjusted for particular countries. Because in these days, as you know, Schrems 2 is embedded. We come to that later. Um, you cannot just use these standard contractual clauses as we did before, which was don't touch it, uh, uh, give me the contract I sign and ignore fine. So this exercise, just signing agreements fine, that's definitely gone. You need to have a closer look and at least you have um, to distinguish between various jurisdictions. And if you read uh, the Schrems 2 judgment properly, it's you have to make distinctions on a case by case basis because a transfer to a provider, for example, in the USA to provider one and a transfer to provider two can have, let's say, circumstances uh, which are different. So no transfer is the same. That makes it very complex, this case by case uh, approach. Anyway, so you need to have your ducks in a row by 27 September 2021, how your new standard contractual clauses should look like, because from that day onwards, everyone in your organization will bang on the door of uh, the privacy team or the legal team and saying, hey, guys, uh, I, I, I need this new standard contractual clauses. Um, uh, and uh, certainly we want to avoid that the new SECs are going to be new bottleneck for all transaction uh, you are negotiating. And I highly recommend to start now uh, creating that template for the controller side so that you're ready if, um, uh, by 27th of September. If you are the importer of data, uh, you also have to prepare yourself. Um, there are two alternatives. Um, the one is we have many, many importer data processor clients that could actually be also a headquarter uh, for a larger entity which receives EU data. Um, you need to be prepared to give the right answers. Yeah, we will have something like, um, you all know technical organizational measures, Article 32, and these have to be filled out by the processor. I will discuss later in that seminar when we come to Schrems 2, we will have some kind of new terms like legal terms, Schrems 2 terms, which in the end need to be filled out by the data processor. So the importers of data, they should be prepared to get massive questions from the data controller about the legal environment um, at the place of the importer. So the data importer should also be prepared for that. So this is the first deadline. So as I said, to do, be prepared for a new uh, standard template for SECs, which applies uh, and which is um, uh, for your company and your specific needs. However, then we have a second deadline. This is 27th of December 2022. And everyone leans back and says, oh, come on, this is one and a half years, uh, 18 or 70 months from now. So uh, why bothering? Because until that date, by this date, you have to replace all existing standard contractual clauses. And I can say from a practical example, we have um, a client here who is somehow on the radar and, and on the hook uh, of one of the German data protection authorities. And they uh, already in um, autumn this year said, uh, please show me how you replace all your existing agreements. And they found out, oops, I have 10,000 10,000. So they have to map 10,000 transfers. And but that's just the first step. Then you have to replace all the contracts. This is a project. If you take the serious, this is a project. Why taking the serious? And this is uh, one of my, um, let's say, uh, core findings of the new standard contractual clauses. Again, I come to that later when we talk about trends too but I will give you an idea, a heads up, why this is so important. In these clauses um, of the new standard contractual clauses, it's, it's clause uh, number 14 and subsection D. 
it says that uh, for the whole transfer assessment, yeah, first of all, it's A and D. First of all, you warrant that you have done all your homework with respect to SHRAMS2. And secondly, there's a duty of documentation for this assessment. We call it transfer impact assessment, TIA. You've probably heard about that. This is about, is my transfer safe into that third country? This whole assessment, it's a little bit like a data protection impact assessment in the end. So it's a legal review. This needs to be documented and um, the authorities on, and it has to be given to the authorities on request. So it's a little bit the same like with our data processing register, Article 30 GDPR. The authorities have the right to ask for the documented assessment for the respective data transfers. This is, uh, and they will do this. So just imagine if you now, without taking the, measure, the necessary care, if you just take the new standard contractual clauses as is, and you say, come on, I, why bother? I take them as standard uh, uh, clauses, I put signature under it, fine. And you do this for, and then you start to replace actually also existing agreements and you replace this in a, let's say, in a little bit of an ignorant way, not really taking care. And then you are half away down the line, like let's take December, 2021. And suddenly an authority knocks on your door and says, listen, uh, you have this documentation duty. Uh, I want to see all your TIA assessments. I see that you, send data to India or to the US, and we would be really interested to see how you justify this. Can I please have your assessments? And if you then, you have nothing, like, oops, uh, uh, I didn't thought about that, yeah? Then you have to undergo the whole replacement exercise again, because the authorities will say, listen, uh, uh, the way you do this and the way you use standard contractual clauses, the new ones, this is not state of the art. You haven't done your homework properly. Please do it again. This transfer is void. Stop it. That is the big risk uh, above all. So don't be kind of um, trapped by the idea, oh, thanks God, I have a model clause. Uh, I just have to sign. Everything works on its own. Yeah, um, It's more than that. Okay. So let's go, let's dive into it. And the first odd thing is um, the scope of application. It's certainly the main addressee, as you can see, is the data exporter. Why? The data exporter is the one who are where the data is collected and generated uh, and then sent out. So the data exporter usually is the data controller and the data controller is the party under the GDPR, which is responsible in the first place. Although you have very large data processors like Microsoft, like Amazon, and they have their own standard agreements and usually they're told allowed to negotiate. Yeah? In theory, it's still the controller who wants to collect data and send data out of the EU who's responsible for that activity, not the processor. Then we have a, a second, I would say, odd point here. If you read the new standard contractual clauses carefully, you see under Article 1, subsection 1, last part of the sentence, that the SECs shall not apply when the data importer, um, when for the data importer, the GDPR applies. What is this? So it could be, but uh, again, I take the example US or India uh, or Japan, yeah? the data importer, uh, for the data importer, the GDPR applies and you know that can happen quite quickly under Article 3 GDPR, the GDPR is very territorial. So this obligation means that before you implement standard contractual clauses, I say by the letter of the law, you even should do an assessment, does this apply for the data importer, yes or no? Because if, or the, the, the upfront question is uh, to be more precisely, do I fall under the GDPR as data importer, yes or no? 
difficult question, tricky question, actually. Um, and if we take this serious, and I come to a practical solution in a second, uh, then we have to do this upfront assessment for every data transfer. This is really very unpractical. So um, we do not really under uh, we we do understand how this I would say rather strange um, precondition uh, kind of last minute came into the standard contractual clauses, and we believe it's a little bit of a misunderstanding between EU Commission and the European Data Protection Board. So for the time being. Uh, we have uh, the standpoint, but we say we do not make that distinction. Uh, we simply, uh, in all cases, where is a data transfer out of the EU, outside of the territory of the EU, um, to so-called third countries, uh, uh, we will implement the standard contractual clauses, the new ones, uh, regardless if the data importer falls under the um, uh, GDPR, yes or no, because uh, the standard contractual clauses provide so much, let's say, uh, security and data protection security that we don't believe any data protection authority could be against it. However, that's a point we still have to elaborate. Uh, we are in contact with our German data protection authorities who are usually very strict and try to figure out how does it mean in practice? Do we really have to do that upfront assessment? What is the ratio for, for that, let's say, strange idea? Is that an accident or is it something the authorities will look, um, uh, will look at uh, in more detail in future? So please have this in the back of your mind uh, and we will follow up on that uh, at a later stage. So now practically spoken, how, how does it work, the new standard contractual clauses? Uh, if you look at them, if you had the chance to look at the standard contractual clauses, first, it's a little bit confusing. It has a modular uh, um, uh, approach. So you have different modules. And by the way, at the end of the slides, you will see Taylor Bessing has created um, a standard contractual uh, clauses generator uh, so that you kind of by uh, legal tech, um, it's a simple solution. Uh, you can um, give in um, your needs uh, and then the output will be a standard contractual clauses template which fits to your situation because it really depends about the parties. Do we have controllers on both sides? Do we have processors on both sides? Do we have the classical one which is controller to processor or do we have the new one which is processor to controller? So you can see these four modules are controller to controller transfer. We had that in the past. That had been the standard contractual clauses of 2001, which are now replaced it. Not, then we have the second module, which is the, the classic one, controller to processor. Uh, this is the module which replaces the standard contractual clauses uh, of uh, 2010. Then we have the long awaited new module, processor to processor. This is very important because we often have these long chains uh, uh, where you have processors in between. And now, fortunately, processors uh, also can uh, undergo um, as data. So if the processor is a data exporter, they have the possibility to agree to standard contractual clauses. This is mostly relevant for those experts among you. You probably know that in the past, if we had the situation, controller in the EU, processor in the EU, sub-processor outside of the EU, the authorities required a so-called direct agreement between the controller in the EU and the sub-processor outside of the EU. This, let's say, complex structure is not necessary anymore because now we can have agreements between the processor in the EU and the processor outside of the EU. The last bit, and I come to that on the next slide, uh, so uh, um, uh, we dealt uh, with that uh, or already. Um, uh, the, the last, uh, um, hold on a second, um, let me go back one slide. The last of these four modules, processor to controller, this is a new one, we have to see how that works. Um, uh, people say, well, uh, this is really uh, a downside for EU processors 
because uh, by way of competition, um, uh, um, they have a hard time to compete against processors who are outside of the EU. Because just imagine there's a controller in the United States and the controller can choose um, between two different processors. One processor sits in the EU and another processor sits in the US. And with the processor in the EU, they have to sign standard contractual clauses. Guess what the controller would prefer? Certainly the processor um, who sits uh, uh, in the US and not in the EU to avoid standard contractual clauses. Hold on, I give some light here. So, um, next one. We uh, had that already. Under B, uh, what I would like to add here is C to P. Uh, contains requirements according to Article 28, subsection 3. What does it mean, actually? That means you may recall that after the GDPR came into force, we had that stupid situation that the existing standard contractual clauses from 2010, there were kind of, um, uh, they had a standard which was below what the GDPR provides for uh, data processing agreements. So what we have done uh, for the last uh, um, uh, two and a half years or three years since the GDPR is in place actually, what we have done is we took the old standard contractual clauses and we put an add-on on top of it. So add-on according to Article 28, subsection 3, and this add on to meet the requirements of the GDPR is not necessary anymore because uh, simply with the new standard contractual clauses, these are updated and meet the requirements of um, 28 subsection 3. Uh, one second, I give this a little bit more light here. So oh, here we go. Um, all right, so there are, there, there are good Good things, uh, not so good thing, things. I think from a practical standpoint, uh, the situation uh, uh, from the, let's say, mere template handling is better, is more flexible. That's good. Um, uh, we have these uh, complicated issues around Schrems 2. Uh, I, come to, uh, I come to it in a second. However, um, we, uh, uh, I, was, I think that take a year and then we maybe find a kind of best practice how to overcome this. Now, um, I think we dealt with this processor to processor. Yep. Um, one new, we have done the first four bullets. Bullet number five, choice of law and jurisdiction. Uh, this is also new uh, and quite interesting. Um, you can choose whatever law um, of any EU jurisdiction. So it could be Greece, it could be Germany, it could be France, whatever uh, comes in handy. Uh, so there's again an, an element of flexibility uh, uh, which we haven't had in the past. So now now we come to the stuff uh, which is which is really hard. Uh, I would say this is uh, one of the core elements of the new standard contractual clauses which makes it so complex. This is the unfamous Schrems 2 judgment. Um, for those who oh, 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 uh, for those who haven't heard about uh, Schrems 2, I think I think you all heard about. That's the judgment um, of July uh, 2021, um, initiated by Mr. Schrems. Uh, therefore, it's called Schrems, and uh, it's called Schrems 2 because it's the second big judgment um, uh, around. Uh, um, yeah, steaming from, from his activity as an activist. The first one was the so-called safe harbor judgment, 10th of October, uh, 2015, where safe harbor, the transfer mechanism to the US was more or less void overnight. And now uh, he challenged the standard contractual clauses uh, because uh, in, in that uh, very case, Schrems at the ECJ uh, Facebook um, then said, if I cannot use safe harbor as a mechanism, I use standard contractual clauses. Schrems uh, said, well, then I go against standard contractual clauses. The way uh, Facebook is using that is void. And it came 
to that long-awaited decision in July 2021, two, uh, which said in a nutshell, well, standard contractual clauses as a mechanism, yeah, that still works also in future, but you have to do a thorough assessment case by case if the law in the country of the data importer provides enough, let's say, safety and security mechanisms so that the EU data, which is transferred to that third country, is cozy and safe. Yeah? And this you have to do on a case by case basis. Very, very complex. And um, the main clauses here, uh, this is Article 14 and Article 15. So um, uh, maybe you scribble this down. Uh, this is uh, the, the larger, uh, it's, it's the part three of the standard contractual clauses and their clause 14, clause 15. This is uh, how Schrems 2 has been incorporated into uh, the standard contractual clauses. And in this article 14, uh, in subsection A, uh, it says the parties warrant for the level of protection in the third country of the data importer. So you, you, uh, the parties kind of give a guarantee that they have done a thorough assessment. Um, and within Article 14, and that's maybe a good thing, the EU Commission had been much more generous than the European Data Protection Board, which is the main data protection authority in Europe, um, uh, who has a very strict view uh, uh, with respect uh, to how to assess the law in third countries. The standard contractual clauses are more flexible and they say there are very many elements which you have to um, consider in your country by country assessment. And they gave you in Article 14 and 15, there are, I call it cliffhanger. There are kind of uh, 12 different cliffhangers. So arguments you can take into consideration when assessing whether the law in the place of the data importer is safe, yes or no. It goes so far. There's even a footnote, the footnote number 12. This is by far my favorite of the, set, of the whole standard contractual clauses because in the footnote it says the parties may also consider practical experience in that country with that law. This uh, allows a high level of flexibility. So if you have a really important transfer into a country which is difficult, and that applies for United States in the first place, that was the country in question for the judgment trends too, but also Russia, China, um, even India um, is not actually every country where you do not have a uh, adequacy status, like Japan has, like UK has now. Um, this gives you a lots of flexibility to really very granular work out um, a TIA, a transfer impact assessment with respect to the law um, at the place of the importer that you somehow can design it in a way that say, well, my practical experience is really good. The security authorities never uh, had any request in the last 20 years. And we, we had one incident uh, and then we, in a cooperative way, could have handled that with the authority. These are practical experience. So Article 14 allows you to create a defensible position for your data transfer. So for you, have it please in the back of your mind, Article 14, New Standard Contractual Clauses, has a requirement that you do a transfer impact assessment with respect to the law, security laws of the country of the importer. However, the good thing is it gives you lots of possibilities to create a defensible position. The downside is it's case by case. So you want to use standard contractual clauses like um, uh, in a standardized way, you as a privacy or legal team of a company um, or as an external lawyer giving advice to companies, you want to give 
kind of a, let's say, a template and a procedure to the business so that they can do it. And suddenly now you have a situation um, where the business, which they are not data protection experts, of course, I think they cannot do a transfer impact assessment. That's impossible. So in countries which are difficult, um, legal slash privacy team and business needs to find a way how to do this transfer impact assessments under Article 14 in a practical way. So as I said, the good news is Article 14 allows to create defensible positions for delicate transfers. The bad news is we have not yet an established best practice how to do that. Then again, the good news is I believe within a year, two years time, um, companies will find their way and design a process uh, uh, which allows uh, not to undergo uh, a case by case review for each and every transfer, but they may have, I don't know, an overview about the laws of the various jurisdictions of the data importers just to make clause 14 and uh, clause 15 requirements easier. Again, as I said in the very beginning, please bear in mind Article 14, subsection A says the party warrants for the level of protection in the third country. And subsection D says on request by the authority, uh, 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 D says two things. First, you have to document your assessment. And secondly, it says on request by the authorities, you have to provide these documents. So there's a documentation duty um, with respect to your TIA. Please take that serious. Uh, I'm almost certain that at least uh, the German authorities um, will use this because it's not a big effort. Yeah, It's a one-liner uh, from the authority to the data controller. Please provide me with your documentation of data transfer assessments according to clause 14, subsection D. Full stop. That's all. Yeah. Well, besides um, this article 14 uh, obligation, uh, there are uh, transparency and information obligations, not only with respect to the transfer impact assessment, but also with respect to uh, data subjects. So that's uh, more or less in article 8. You have all these uh, um, ob obligations. Um, uh, and um, that means, but this is something what you already know. Yeah, this is, uh, if there's a data subject access request and so on, uh, uh, this now also um, uh, goes beyond the typical information and it includes a standard contractual clause information. So uh, uh, in the standard contractual clauses by the wording, actually they even somehow stimulate uh, third party uh, um, access uh, information rights. And they even stimulate, uh, if you uh, um, look very closely into the standard contractual clauses, they even stimulate uh, that data subjects who are of the opinion that their rights have been infringed um, may claim compensation. So on the horizon, there's something what we don't have yet in Europe, but what we know from the US, this is um, in case of a data breach, that um, mass claims um, could be possible more easily. And the standard contractual clauses have that mechanism uh, uh, because they kind of more or less clarify. It's a clarification. It's not a, it's not a new obligation. They clarify that data subjects have a claim in case of uh, breach of their data, provided the preconditions of the GDPR are given, of course. So the next bullet, obligation to examine official requests for a data disclosure. This is the article or the, the clause number 15. Yeah, also somehow Schrems tool related. This is like, what do I have to do if the authorities are knocking on my door uh, and say, give me data? Yeah, how do I have to handle such requests in particular um, with respect to making sure that um, you consider the rights of the data subjects to the best 
um, uh, to the best possible extent. So it's a little bit of a playbook, what to do when the authority knocks on your door. And there is one good news, because uh, there are some softening word, wording inside, like to the extent possible, or if allowed under um, the relevant laws. So that means if you, for example, have a security law, which very, very clearly says, well, um, if we knock on your door, uh, top one obligation is not to tell everyone. Yeah? Then clause 15 kind of accept this. Yeah? And this is uh, here, the EU Commission is far more generous um, than the uh, European Data Protection Board in that respect. And I'm not 100% sure if this is in line with the Schrems 2 judgment. Maybe in three, four years time, someone is also um, tackling the new standard contractual clauses. Maybe it's against Schrems. Maybe Schrems will go to court again uh, and create a um, judgment called Schrems 3. And then I'm almost certain that this Article 15 will be subject to review uh, if this is in line with the law or if the EU Commission was too generous. For us, for the time being, it's good. It has a kind of, as I said, playbook how to deal with these requests. Okay, um, that's it for here. So this is what we already covered. Um, so I don't want to repeat everything. Transfer impact assessment clause 14, really, really very important. Please make sure that you have installed a good practice how to do these transfer impact assessments. It's a little bit like DPIA, data protection assessments. In the end, it's, yeah, it's a legal assessment. Yeah? Uh, it adds to the complexity that you have to uh, assess third country security laws. These laws are usually not addressed and, um, to companies. So the whole design of those laws is not like um, that it's easy to digest but for a company. These laws are addressed to the society. Still, you have to find out um, uh, to which extent uh, they are compatible with the new standard contractual clauses. Um, let's say looking into the future, uh, the European Data Protection Board already announced that they are working on a kind of global third country assessment yeah? um, to make life easier. However, uh, Schrems 2, which kind of uh, has a um, legal assessment for the US and, uh, em embodied. It took kind of two and a half years um, uh, until it came into force. So let, me, let me be precisely six, 16, 17, 18, wow, far more years. Yeah? So it took years to do that assessment. Um, that was initiated actually by the Irish uh, High Court who was responsible there. Anyway, I guess uh, it would take five years or so um, before the European Data Protection Board has done such an assessment. Plus, I believe that the assessment by the European Data Protection Board will be very, very strict and therefore not really useful for you in practice. I more think that by us, televising other law firms, there will be kind of kind of crowd intelligence um, uh, uh, and uh, somehow by the end of this year or next year, uh, there will be databases uh, accessible with kind of standard assessments of security laws of these third uh, uh, countries. Good. Um, so other issues uh, we would like uh, to mention uh, very briefly. Fixed character. So that means um, uh, don't touch it. Yeah, uh, and in particular, don't try to negotiate and make it less uh, lower the standard. This is something what we had before. What you certainly can do is make it more stricter, but you cannot kind of bend it and you cannot negotiate it like a civil law agreement, certainly. Um, uh, yeah, um, third party preference. Uh, we we uh, discussed this uh, already as well. So um, third parties may claim uh, rights under the SECs, 
uh, like customers uh, of, uh, of of companies um, who which which um, uh, data is transferred um, they are protected uh, under the SEC's hierarchy. Yeah, the, it's strictly uh, uh, by way of hierarchy. Uh, the standard contractors are always on top. Um, you see this very often in contracts with um, with um, master services agreement with MSA. You have a data protection clause, which is kind of referencing into an annex. And in the annex, you have the standard contractual clauses. Make sure that um, uh, whatever you write down in your MSA does not contradict with the standard contractual clauses. And if it does, it doesn't help because uh, standard contractual clauses are um, on top. This is ex in particular relevant for um, limitation of liability. Often you see that exporters um, uh, try to limit their um, uh, liability um, in the MSA which then again is not possible under the SECs. And you can see this here, liability, that's clause 12. Um, uh, same applies uh, in particular not only for data exporters, and I have to correct me, it's more the data importer who is handling the data, who is at risk here, and who usually tries to limit the liability, and that's going to be very hard. Um, so don't exhaust yourself uh, in negotiations about uh, liability caps look first into the standard contractual clauses to which extent uh, this allows discretion and that's very limited. Um, uh, otherwise, it's a waste of time. Docking clause, clause seven, that's quite practical. Um, other parties can, uh, by way of signature, uh, um, be part of uh, these agreements. So this is less paperwork um, you have to do here. We talked about choice of law, uh, supervision by the authorities. Um, uh, we already uh, referred to this uh, more including yeah, obligation to make available a copy of the SSC to people affected. That's what I said previously, that uh, data subject access rights are somehow extended also to the SSCs. So um, one have to make it um, technically uh, um, easily um, and uh, my recommendation here is if you have already an established um, data subject access, access request uh, procedure, make sure that standard contractual clauses are somehow uh, linked to that so that you don't have to run around in the company and look for particular agreements. Um, okay, termination rights. I mean, that's, uh, I, I skipped that. Special termination rights. I mean, if everything goes wrong uh, under the standard contractual clauses and data is handled uh, in a bad way, you can terminate. Um, so these two slides, this one and that one, I just would like uh, uh, to mention a very important thing. It really makes a difference if you are a data exporter or if you are a data importer because um, the standard contractual clauses have a different effect. First of all, the main obligation and the main addressee of uh, actually the Schrems II judgment and the standard contractual clauses is the data exporter. So the data exporter who usually sits in the EU, he has, let's say, uh, I like to call it hot potato. He has the issue, the problem, in, it, in the hands and says, okay, I send out the data, I'm responsible. However, that doesn't mean the data importer, and I have here a little like um, we, uh, um, a bullet point list, uh, what is the distinction uh, and what to take care of. I don't wanna read this out. Um, the data importer uh, then again, he shouldn't lean back and say, well, um, it's, it's not my piece of cake, it's the controllers to, uh, who has to do the work because sooner or later, all the practical problems are with the data importer. So what the data exporter and what our data exporter clients here in the EU are doing at the moment, they kind of take the hot potato and throw the burden to the data importer. What does it mean practically? Uh, the data exporters these days, they um, 
uh, they have large questionnaires and I'm sure some of the data importers already um, have been like uh, seeing this. So um, uh, they have excessive questionnaires where they ask lots of questions to the data importer with respect to how the situation is according to the importer's law. So this kind of TIA requirement I talked about under clause 14, yeah, the transfer impact assessment requirement. In the first place, the data exporter is responsible for that. However, the data exporter shift this to the data importer. The data importer should do the work because the data importer is closer to the law. So what we see and what we actually do for the data controllers is we create questionnaires with like, how is your law, uh, how is your practical experience um, uh, in, uh, in your country, uh, has there ever been an incident, and so on and so on. So what we do is we take the cliffhangers, the kind of preconditions of Article 14, Article 15, we take this, we put this into a questionnaire, this questionnaire goes to the data importer and the data importer more or less have to give the answers. So in the end, it is very similar to what we know from, um, uh, from the TOMS, from the technical and organizational measures. And I believe in future, we will see standard contractual clauses with an additional annex where you kind of, uh, where the questionnaire I'm talking about is more or less transformed into an annex to the standard contractual clauses. And by way of asking things, um, the data importer has to fill this all out. Yeah? And in a fashion, uh, and this will then be the basis for the risk assessment of the data controller. But the data controller is certainly dependent on the answers of the data importer to do this risk assessment. And certainly the data exporter doesn't want to have the burden of review and the burden of um, kind of uh, examination of foreign laws. And they say, listen provider, as part of your service, please make sure that uh, you provide us uh, with the right answers according to the new standard contractual clauses. This is what we see. So the take for the importer is, dear importer, be prepared for these questionnaires. Be prepared to fill out respective exhibits to the standard contractual clauses to give the right answers. Don't try to negotiate that because then you're out of the game. Please, uh, data importer, show uh, that you know about all this, that you care about all this, and play the game. And the game is uh, best effort and create a defensible position so that data, data transfers are possible. These are standard contractual clauses. Now I would, uh, for the remaining time, because um, this certainly is also uh, important, uh, just would like to give you an idea about how the authorities look at this. Um, you probably heard about um, the immediate reaction of the uh, EDPB, this stands for European Data Protection Board, and this is the gathering of all national data protection authorities. And when they saw the Schrems II, um, recommend, uh, the Schrems II decisions, they provided recommendations um, back in November 2020, which have been very, very strict, to be honest. Um, the good thing is the standard contractual clauses did not, so the commission did not follow all this. So they, as I, desc as I described um, and discussed earlier, they gave a little bit more flexibility uh, to it. Um, and now uh, the EDPB has kind of revised its recommendations. Still, um, uh, they are very strict and stricter in my eyes, uh, as I, as a lawyer, uh, would, um, uh, would recommend. So um, my practical point is, yes, you can take the recommendations of the EDPB somehow as a kind of guideline, but it's just an opinion. It's just a recommendation. And the recommendation of the EDPBs are usually more strict than the court would decide. So on a, on a risk side, uh, the EDPB 
often takes a very extreme super safe view. Um, uh, and, and so I, I wouldn't recommend to take this as law. This is not law. This is an opinion. Uh, a law firm like us, we can, we, we can have another opinion and then the court has to decide. And we saw in the past that uh, very important recommendations of the, uh, of the German data protection authorities actually failed in court. Yeah? How to calculate the amount of, um, uh, uh, um, of penalties. They, they had a kind of decision mechanism. First time it went to court, that was in Bonn. The court says, this is rubbish. Yeah? And uh, so uh, uh, it's good that we have these recommendations. It's good to, to know how the authorities think about, but don't mix it up. It's not law. Yeah? Um, in particular, uh, the EDPB says, um, organize the judgment says, you need to implement um, if the law of the third country is not safe, um, and that applies basically for all jurisdictions who do not have an adequacy decision. If it's not safe, you have to add additional contractual, organizational, and technical measures. That's what the court says. The EDPB says, well, organizational and contractual measures are fine, but not enough. Technical measures like encryption, um, anonymization is a kind of must have. And in my eyes, this goes too far because the use cases, the EDPB kind of regards as justified, they are just covering 5% of the today's data transfers, if less. So the EDPB in the end has a recommendation, which is not a recommendation, which results in, well, make sure that the data stays in Europe. And that's not really very useful. But what is good, and this is, uh, let's say, uh, the last bit uh, I would like to try uh, to, to, to bring your attention to. Please use this kind of uh, step plan um, of the uh, European Data Protection Board um, if you want to check uh, how to use standard contractual clauses, because that's quite good. Uh, they say, first of all, first step, and this applies in particular for the second deadline I was talking about, 27th of December, 2022. Please recall, by then you have to replace all your existing agreements, how to do that properly. Please use this kind of um, a step plan. Uh, the first one is know your transfers. It's more or less a, it's a due diligence. You have to see and, uh, um, and map your data transfers. And then you say, well, if the data transfer is in the EU or EAA, green, fine, done. If the data transfer goes out of the EU or the EEA, so it's a third country, then I go to step two and I see, is there any justification sending that out? Is there any, we call it transfer tool? And the best one, the let's say, uh, um, top number one king or queen of um, uh, transfer tool is the entire country has an adequacy decision. And this is really good news for Japan, for the UK, uh, for, I don't know, Argentina, Canada, and so on. So we have approximately um, uh, 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 close to 20 jurisdictions uh, who benefit and enjoy a so-called adequacy decision that means the whole country has an adequate level of data protection. Wherever EU data is sent to, it is adequately safe. So done. Yeah. No SECs necessary. Then exemptions, that's Article 49. There are some exemptions, like if you have a consent and under certain circumstances, a transfer could be allowed, but that doesn't apply for mass transfers. This is only useful for... Um, for let's say exceptional cases, yeah? And for the rest, yeah, more or less you have standard contractual clauses and binding corporate rules. Uh, um, and this is all transfers to the US, to China, to Russia, to India, to many countries in Africa, um, uh, to Brazil, basically all countries who do not have an adequacy decision, yeah? Um, if you have a transfer into these countries, 
you go to step three and step four. And, and these are, let's say, again, here you find the Schrems 2 decision inside. This is somehow Article 14, Article 15 uh, of the standard contractual clauses. Yeah? You need to do under step three this um, uh, assessment of national law uh, where the data importer sits. Yeah? Um, if the assessment comes to the result, well, this is rather good law and safe, fine. If not, then you go to step four. So you have, it doesn't mean, it doesn't say you should not allow to transfer data, but it means you have to put on additional supplementary measures. And these are more or less all these kind of measures, uh, article or, or clause 14 uh, is giving you kind of a, let's say an idea of what you can do and what you can check, yeah? Um, to be honest, to our experience, if a country has no adequacy decision, I hardly ever believe that um, a legal assessment of the law of the data importer come to the result green and fine. Because if it would be green, it would have had an adequacy decision already. So you can skip this more or less if you have standard contractual clauses uh, and a transfer to a third party with no adequacy decision, you more or less uh, also need supplementary measures um, uh, on top of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, time, time is uh, time is running out, uh, but uh, we 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 will make it. Uh, so this is the core. Step three, step four, clause fourteen, clause fifteen. This is the real uh, uh, um, uh, core element of Schrems two in the standard contractual clauses. This is our big challenge. Um, some recommendations, and I talked about most of them already. Yeah, uh, uh, good stuff. Modular. Um, uh, make sure that you um, uh, are in line with the two deadlines we discussed up front. Um, so you will have all these kind of um, questionnaires uh, coming in already now. We discussed this. Uh, data importers need to have their ducks in a row as well. They should not lean back and say everything is fine. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't bother me. Um, that's a good one here. Bullet point number four. Don't forget for the data processing agreement under Article 28. Um, uh, of the GDPR, so for transfers uh, within the EU and the EEA, there's also a new template. So there's a template for these, um, let's say, internal data transfers inside the EU EEA. Please uh, don't forget that uh, um, around uh, the new SECs. So then we have uh, UK Switzerland. Whoops, uh, this uh, adds to the complexity. Um, uh, a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, the UK uh, did not say the, G the UK copy pasted the GDPR, but did not copy paste the standard contractual clauses due to the contrary. Um, it was says, well, um, don't use the new standard contractual clauses. Please go on, use the old one, because the UK may think about go uh, own in different way. I don't know where to go, uh, where they want to go. The good thing is UK has an adequacy decision in status, but they may will have another transfer mechanism. So that means if you uh, if you review your transfers uh, out of the, um, let's say, European region, don't forget UK is not Europe anymore. UK is also not EEA. It's our own country with own laws. Uh, so we uh, uh, and there will be own transfer mechanisms. Um, so pain points, we discussed pain points uh, in detail. I don't have to repeat this again. Um, uh, um, you, can, you can read this. This is more or less a, a summary also what to do. Uh, it's the summary of what we discussed already. Make a game plan, uh, make this kind of six step approach by the EDPB, start with the data mapping. Don't wait, to be honest. Don't wait uh, uh, because the deadlines are coming very fast. My main takeaway here is make sure that you have a suitable template for you in place.
by the deadline, 27th of uh, September. Don't forget about your internal communication processes in your organization. It all takes time. Yeah. So that's telemessing who we are and that we certainly can help and that uh, these are the guys who build actually our standard contractual generator and here's a link to that and we have very many further information on your website uh, we will keep you um, uh, we will keep you in touch uh, it won't be the last uh, seminar on this i'm sure that close to the deadline 27th of september we will do another one we will do workshops if someone of you would like to have a workshop for your company more detailed more tailor-made please reach out we are happy uh, to assist uh, here on a fixed fee basis well that's it uh, thank you very much uh, for coming um, i will answer questions uh, who had been uh, coming in um, yeah good luck with all of that uh, uh, we will find a way uh, in the end uh, the mere fact that you attend this Kickoff meeting uh, shows that uh, you are on the right track. Uh, see you next time soon. Uh, bye bye. Have a nice evening. Have a nice day. Bye.